comets. These infrequent visitors to our local neighbourhood have been studied for hundreds of years. In times long since past, they were seen as heralds of great tidings, though whether it was for good or for ill rather depended on who was doing the foretelling. In recent times, modern astronomers have realised that they are fundamental to answering some of the most important questions about our solar system, including how it formed and possibly even how life started on this planet. And here's the good news. You might just be able to see one for yourself. I'm Dr. Greg Brown of the Royal Observatory Greenwich, and today I'm going to be talking about all things comet. Comets are balls of icy, dirty, snowy rock flying around our solar system. They come from two of the most distant regions in our solar system. One, the Kuiper Belt, is where you'd find the dwarf planet Pluto. The other is called the Oort Cloud. Both of these are extremely distant. The Kuiper Belt forms a ring around our solar system in the same plane as all of the other planets orbit. And it starts at about the distance of Neptune and reaches about to 50 times the distance from the Earth to the Sun. The Oort cloud, on the other hand, is a giant sphere that surrounds the entire solar system. And while it's rather difficult to determine where that sphere ends, it might even touch the Oort clouds of other stars. In other words, light years across or hundreds of thousands of times more distant than the Earth is from the Sun. Now, both of these regions contain large numbers of pieces of ice and rock, basically comets. But, crucially, they aren't yet on their long path into the centre of the solar system. You see, something happens, perhaps there's a collision, or maybe there's just a nudge from another object with its gravity that sends the object spiralling inwards to the centre of the solar system. If it's lucky and survives its infall, it might set up a stable orbit, heading into the centre of the solar system, scooting around the sun, and then heading out into the distant reaches again before coming back on regular intervals. We have two types of repeating comets, short period comets, which last less than 200 years in one full orbit. And these probably come from the Kuiper Belt. And they include the famous Halley's Comet, which has a period of 75 years or so. We also have long period comets coming from the Oort cloud with periods of longer than 200 years, but anything up to tens of thousands of years. So certainly within the human lifespan, we only see these comets once. We also have non-repeating comets, comets that fly into the solar system and then never set up a stable orbit, perhaps because they're flung out into distant parts of space, never to be heard from again. Alternatively, their journey can come to a, an abrupt end by crashing into an object in our solar system, like comet Shoemaker Levy 9 did in 1994, crashing into the giant planet Jupiter in 21 distinct chunks. Now, as comets come closer to the sun, the volatile materials that they're made out of begin to melt and evaporate, producing vast clouds of gas around them. And these produce the long tails that comets are so well known for and make them particularly distinctive. While the central nucleus, the, the rocky bit of the comet, is usually only a few tens of kilometres across, these tails can be up to hundreds of millions of kilometres in length. Understandably, then, they are fantastic targets for amateur astronomers wanting to take images of some of the most stunning objects in our solar system. But they're also important for professional astronomers as well. They come from regions of the solar system that are thought to be pristine remnants of how the solar system formed, bits of stuff left over from when all of the planets and other major objects were formed. And so by studying comets, we're studying a record of what the solar system was like all the way back at its beginning four and a half billion years ago. 
Also, while outer planets like Uranus and Neptune formed in places where water in particular was common, the inner planets were likely bone dry when they formed. So our own Earth must have received its amount of water later on. And one possibility is that they might have come from comets. So it's possible that water, the water that makes up our oceans, could have been delivered from impacts from these comets onto the surface of the Earth. It's also possible that the complex compounds which go into making simple life may also have been present on comets too. So it's very possible that life itself happened because of cometary impacts on the Earth. It's important then that we study as many of these comets as we can in as much detail as possible. We do that using telescopes from here on the ground, but also in orbit around the Earth. And we send probes out to some of these comets too. One of the most successful missions of this type was the Rosetta mission, which tailed the surprisingly duck-shaped Comet 67P Churyumov-Gerasimenko, and also landed the much smaller probe Philae onto its surface. Now, while individual comets are indeed infrequent visitors, often taking long periods of time to get back to the inner solar system where we can see them, there are so many of them in our solar system that in reality we see quite a few each year. The thing is, the vast majority of them are far too faint to be seen with the unaided eye. Earlier last month, hopes that Comet C2019 Y4 Atlas would become the first unaided eye visible comet in some years were dashed when it turned out that it had broken up into many fragments on its close in, uh, encounter with the sun and that pretty much guaranteed that it would not get bright enough to be seen with the unaided eye. C2017 T2 Pan Stars is at least a decent consolation prize, visible right now. In fact, right when this video is going out is the best time to try and see it. You need to be looking towards the north, out towards the constellation of Camelopardalis, one of the lesser known constellations, but halfway between the W of Cassiopeia and the well-known asterism of the Plough in Ursa Major. Unfortunately, this isn't bright enough to be seen with the unaided eye, so you will need at least a pair of binoculars or a small telescope to see it. But we might just be able to do better. Last month, a new comet was discovered, C2020 F8 Swan. And it is already visible to the unaided eye for observers in the Southern Hemisphere. Later this month, it is going to start appearing above our horizon just for a relatively short period of time and it might well be getting even brighter. So there is a very good chance that you'll be able to see your own comet with your unaided eyes. In order to do so, you need to be looking towards the northwest, towards the very end of this month. We're looking here on the 30th of this month and you need to look for the bright star Capella. It will be low on the horizon, but if you're very lucky, as long as your horizon is low enough and as long as the comet gets bright enough to be seen in the twilight when the sun has just set, you might just be able to see the comet for yourself. So there you have it. A chance to be able to see your very own cosmic ice delivery service. For more up-to-date information on where these comets are going to be and how to see them, try online services such as theskylive.com, where you will be able to see up-to-date information on where these comets are going to be and where they'll be visible to wherever you live. Happy hunting.